an artist is a title that you earn, and that uh, it's a little embarrassing to hear people refer to themselves as artists. It's like referring to themselves as a genius. This was a man who was uh, a Merlin of curiosity. He was driven by his curiosity. We weren't sure quite what he was. Was he an architect? Was he a designer? Was he a filmmaker? But what he was, obviously, was something we all wanted to be. I had some change as a painter right when we were working on the furniture. And again, in film, it never seemed like leaving painting in any way because it was just another form. She made paintings out of what she was surrounded by. Everything she touched, she turned into something magical. Everything that they did in design, she saw as an extension of her painting. And everything they did in design, he saw as an extension of his architecture. For them, these names like painter and architect, they weren't job descriptions. They were ways of looking at the world. They were introducing people to look at the world differently. Life was fun, was work, was fun, was life. People would say it was childlike behavior, but what's wrong with that? It seems as if put all this joy back into life, you know, that modernism, let's face it, was getting boring. And they just designed the furniture, they'd be in the pantheon. It's the multifaceted nature of the career that is extraordinary. They give shape to America's 20th century. I came from an architectural office where there were individual tables with a conference room and there was carpet on the floor, there were lights, we had drafting tables and all the equipment that you needed, et cetera, et cetera. I walk into Eames' office and it was like walking into a circus. I walked in the door and of course I immediately thought, I'm just totally blown away by the patina on every surface of graphics and there were models everywhere and there was just stuff. I was just overwhelmed. I saw this incredible apparition of animation stands and, and photographs spread out on tables, models being lit for photography, a screening room and a wonderful wood shop, saltwater tanks. There were same chairs with Steinberg drawings on them. Every kind of visual treat you can imagine. And I thought, I've come to work in Disneyland. If you had to take the roof off of it, you'd see that place changing constantly. So we just go around and take everything out of the middle of the studio to put up a movie set to take pictures tomorrow. And then the next day, you'd take out all the movie set and put the tables all back up and everybody's back at work again. It was very informal. I mean, there wasn't ever any kind of routine. There were no, quote, regular meetings. Because I did not have a design degree, many of the people in the office thought I probably shouldn't be there. But Charles had a different attitude. And he said this to me. I can teach you how to draw if you can think and you can see and you can prove that to me. You can work here. For four decades, 901 Washington Boulevard in Venice Beach, California, was one of the most creative addresses on earth. Dozens of gifted young designers cut their teeth within the walls of the studio. But the vision for the office came from the top. Uh, for the, the, you have to have a place where you can recognize where you're going yes. to start out. Modern design was born from the marriage of art and industry. The Eames office was born from the marriage of Ray Kaiser, a painter who rarely painted, and Charles Eames, an architecture school dropout who never got his license. Eventually, everything connects, Charles said. Furniture, toys, architecture, exhibitions, photography, and film were all connected in the wild, whimsical world of the Eames office. Charles and Ray Eames wanted to bring the most magnificent experiences that you could have with your eyes to the largest number of people. I don't think there's anything more important for an artist to want to do. It was a career that defined what it means to be a designer. And it all began with a chair. Charles, where did the classic Eames chair come from? 
Did it come to you in a flash or as you were shaving one morning? It, it sort of came to me in a 30-year flash. <laughs> <laughs> Time magazine called it the greatest design of the 20th century. But it didn't start out that way. It began as a failure. Responding to a competition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1940, two unknown young architects, Charles Eames and his friend, Eero Saarinen, set out to reinvent the very idea of the chair. The goal is to create an inexpensive, mass-produced chair which is well-designed and which is molded to the body because it doesn't need a lot of upholstery, which is A, old-fashioned, and B, expensive. Upholstery is what Louis XIV did. Working at the Cranbrook Academy of Art near Detroit, Eames and Saarinen thought they could mold the new miracle material, plywood, into two directions at once to make a comfortable, form-fitting shell. The critical point is where that back becomes the seat. The glues aren't good enough and the chair splinters, which means when you'd sit on it, you know, it'd be a little uncomfortable, so they have to upholster it. Despite failing at their goal of creating a single-piece plywood shell, Charles and Arrow won the competition. The irony is that the chair that Eames and Saren designed, they couldn't really manufacture. Even with the upholstery to cover the cracked surface, no existing machine could successfully mold the plywood into the shape of the chair. It couldn't be made in the way that they claimed it could be made. They designed the look of it without designing the substance of it. After many unsuccessful attempts, Aero Saarinen scrapped the project. But Charles wasn't ready to give up, this time with a new partner. At Cranbrook, he had become friendly with Ray Kaiser, a talented young artist who had helped with the chair project. I said to Ray one day, how do you and Charles get together? Oh, I can't talk about it. I said, well, why not? Well, we just did. They sparked, and the rest is literally history. And I think in Ray, he really found his compliment. But there was a problem. Charles was already married. He had moved up to Cranbrook from St. Louis with his wife, Catherine, and his young daughter, Lucia. The love letters are Charles's letters to Ray, because the letters that Ray wrote back to Charles, Charles destroyed because he was married. You know, they show Charles madly in love with her, there's no doubt about that. He talks about walking past the building that she used to look in and looking up at her window, and they are very moving. Those letters are talking about a joint future as artists together. I think his decision feels made. Ray certainly felt uncomfortable enough to leave Cranbrook and go away and think about what she was going to do thereafter. Catherine was a very impressive person. Knowing them both as I did, you can see why they didn't stay together. He really thought he had something to offer the world. And this was gonna be a journey with a lot of unexpectedness. This is a journey that might not lead to uh, success. And I think that maybe at that point in her life, this was not necessarily the place that Catherine wanted to go. But I think that maybe in Charles's mind that he had wanted a life where love and work and life and work were all blended together. Charles quit his job at Cranbrook and in one last letter to Ray, asked for her hand in marriage. His future with his new bride now depended on making the chair work. Broke and short on options, Charles and Ray headed from Michigan to L.A. to finish what he had started. Part of this journey to California was they were both going to figure out how to mass produce mold and plywood and compound curves, which sounds very unromantic, but I think it probably was pretty romantic under the circumstances. In their two-bedroom apartment in Westwood Village, Charles and Ray set up a makeshift workshop. Got the first tool that did the molding, which was so magic, we called it by a magic name, so called a Kazam. The Kazam machine was a jerry-rigged molding device made out of heating coils and a bicycle pump. But in 1942, with the nation at war, raw materials were scarce, and the Kazam lay silent. But with a setback, there was also opportunity. The U.S. military needed better splints. The standard issue splint was metallic. 
And so the vibration of the two people carrying them actually would make the wound worse. They would actually be better off if you grabbed a stick off the ground and tied it to it than with this amplification. So Charles Ray said, well, you know, we're experimenting with molded plywood. Why don't we try to design a new splint? They're trying to make a three-dimensional curve, kind of a bowl, you might say. They can't quite do it yet. So they need holes in the plywood in order to release the tension, because otherwise it's going to splinter where they try to do it. But working within the constraints, what's nice is that this is exactly what you need for a splint, because you need a place for the bandages to go. In a rented warehouse space, their team of skilled designers and craftspeople made 150,000 splints. With peace approaching, Charles and Ray had one thing on their minds, applying the lessons of the splints to the failed plywood chairs. This time, they wouldn't design the look of the chair first. They would never make that mistake again. They would let the design flow from the learning. That meant knowing who they were serving. In Charles's words, it was always about being a good host to their guests. The people we wanted to serve were varied. And to begin with, we studied the shapes and postures of many types, averages and extremes. But it was more than just a search for the best chair design. It was the beginning of the Eames design process, a process of learning by doing. In the design of any structure, it is often the connection that provides the key to the solution. Never delegate understanding, Charles said. It would become a hallmark of Eames design their secret ingredient. Charles said, yeah, there's a secret. First you have an idea, then you discard the idea, then you have 50 other ideas and you discard them, and then you do several models, and they don't work and you throw them off. And the secret is work and work and work and work and work. The plywood furniture was good to go in 1946. Charles said of the furniture, we wanted to make the best for the most, for the least. That sentiment struck a chord with the Herman Miller Furniture Company. Honest and simple in its use of materials, the plywood furniture was also affordable for the common man. Together, they would become one of the great success stories of the post-war era. Charles and Ray Eames provide much of the furniture for a kind of upper middle class, educated audience moving to suburbia. When the Second World War ended, it wasn't just five years of pent-up demand. It was actually almost 15 years, because you also have 10 years of the Depression. And people have much more money. So if you wanted to sort of do something different than your parents, you bought that Eames furniture. And it was promoted that way. Everything around the marketing suggested, here is something new for a new society. And America was a new society in 45. In the decades to follow, Charles and Ray scored success with line after line of Eames furniture, and their unmistakable designs became a ubiquitous part of American culture, right up to today. Sold for 900 I think the work retains a real freshness. The elements of it still inform contemporary design today. 21 and a half? of the furniture will continue to appeal to new generations. The word Eames has now become a generic word. And if you go on eBay, it always says Eames era, blah, blah, blah. So it's become a word like Victorian. Maybe it's in a way accurate, because just like Queen Victoria represents an attitude, Eames also embodies a certain approach to life and to thinking. By the early 50s, Charles had grown an outsized reputation as an icon of modernism, fighting to inject an ethical dimension into American capitalism. At that price, the customer knows exactly what he's going to get. This? In MGM's executive suite, William Holden stars as a curiously Charles Eames-like furniture designer. We'll have a line of low-priced furniture, a new and different line. As different from anything we're making today as a modern automobile is different from a covered wagon. In the outside world, Charles's reputation may have grown larger than life, but within the Eames office, there was always the lingering question of credit. There are still some sore issues among certain people who feel they never were recognized as much as they should, but it's a very delicate issue. The issue came to a head back in 1946 at the unveiling of the original Eames chair. 
when the Museum of Modern Art gave Charles a one-man show. MoMA gives the name Charles Eames, and this causes a certain tension in the office because it was thought to be a collaborative effort. It's not that he's swooping in or is doing nothing and scarfing up all the credit, but he is not the only designer that was involved. This happens all the time. A group of young people co-creating and influencing each other and inspiring each other, and then the question is, who did what? One of the last projects I worked on was Day of the Dead, the film. I was down in Mexico helping with that film, shooting, gathering objects, and setting the type, and I wrote Assistance in Mexico, and I wrote the names of the people. So Charles came by my desk and said, what is that? And I said, but we worked on it, didn't we? I went to New York many, many times, putting the time life lobbies together, and Charles never went and saw them while the things were being constructed. But I could never say that I designed anything at the Eames office. I never saw anything come out of there that was not signatured, you know, by, by, by him and, and Ray. When a product comes out, it's a river. It starts at one point and it ends at another point. Many people jump into it along the way. Everybody contributes a small piece, but only if they go on after that to produce a stunning amount of work. I think, are they capable of saying, I did this, this, and this, in the Eames office with no credit? I think he ran the office a bit like a Renaissance studio. You know, there's a master painter, but then there are all the other people who helped realize the work. He may have been exploiting us, but if you are not stupid, you are also exploiting that relationship. I was happy being exploited by a proper master. The most wonderful work is, is the conscience and the talents of a person who have every right to have their name on it, even though it's done by minions of other people. Things good and bad, he rightfully has his name on them, and they rightfully are Charles Eames or Charles and Ray Eames products. Almost always when there's a successful man, there is a very interesting and able woman behind him. And a better case could seldom be found than in Ray and Charles Eames. Come on in, Ray. Hello, I'm so happy to see you. This is Mrs. Eames, and she's going to tell us how she helps Charles design these chairs. How do you manage that? <laughs> well, uh, aside from serving as an extreme in the testing <laughs> there are a million things. But uh, I think the most difficult thing is to keep the big idea, <laughs> to be able to look critically at the work. Yes, well, I think... Arlene Francis is clearly having a hard time with this husband and wife working together. You know, this is the era of Mad Men, as we're watching now. This is not fitting, and Charles Eames is trying to promote Ray Eames as saying that we collaborated on this. Well, uh, Ray, Ray was a painter. Ray uh, worked here in New York with Hans Hoffman for a long time, which is a pretty good start. I actually thought Charles was more embarrassed than Ray. Ray is hidden away. Charles is being highlighted, the great male designer. It's a very interesting moment of American sexual politics in the 1950s. Uh, I wonder if you're going to maybe take us through and show how, how the Eames chair has developed. And Ray, shall we let Charles do it? Do you want please. to help with well, it? Please. No, you see, she, as I told you, she is behind the man, but terribly important. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. All right, Charles. The feminist conscience had not been yet raised. Ray would always stand behind Charles. And on camera or in interviews, she said hardly anything. Her warm but quiet conversation shrank to total silence before the camera, but her impact on Eames' work spoke for her. She sat like a delicious dumpling in a doll's dress, concentrating on a sweep of subjects which would seemingly choke a computer. People always made the mistake that Charles and Ray, it was two brothers. They were a married couple. Well, at the same time, they were partners in whatever their design effort was. Ray felt, I think, deeply enraged and hurt on occasion when it was assumed that it was actually just Charles's business and it was the office of Charles Eames, not the office of Charles and Ray Eames. It was Charles who was in charge, but the body of work would not have been the same without Ray's contributions. And how you separate that out, I don't know. If the public saw Ray as little more than the devoted wife supporting her husband, 
Charles saw a talented artist who had participated in the birth of abstract art in America. Her mentor was the German abstract expressionist Hans Hoffmann. Hoffmann is one of the great catalytic figures in American art. He starts a school in New York City in 33 with, at times, no more than a dozen or two students. They together are the seed out of which the new American art really grows. He was getting ideas from people like Mondrian, Paul Clay, Kandinsky, but he was communicating them not as textbook learning, but as this incredibly visceral sensation. And I have talked to people who remember him walking into the studio and looking at a drawing of theirs and tearing it down the middle and then taking the two parts and moving them. And then suddenly something that had been very static was dynamic. So I think it's there that Ray learned some at least of this wonderful capacity that she had for collaging, for juxtaposition. She can move things around very, very easily and beautifully and find form and then find form in relation to other form. Ray knew what was art and what was not. And Charles depended on her aesthetic genius. And she would put objects on shoots that would just bring the whole thing to life. By putting the stack of black wire chairs naked with the wooden bird with little wire legs, gave you a very different feeling about those chairs. Charles could not deal with the idea that any of the furniture would have color on it. If you put a palette of colors in front of him, it's just like he couldn't handle it. He just, it just went over his head. He deferred her completely on color sense. She saw everything as a painting. She had these enormous eyes that were, they were open like this all the time. And I think Charles was very dependent on that. You could just hear him say, Ray, which meant come and help. At the Library of Congress, Ray's letters to a traveling Charles show her fastidious attention to every detail of their life and work. When she writes to Charles in Paris and she's talking about the slides that he's just taken and she has this sketch showing how she and Sandro and Don Albinson have changed the chair. And then she's going on about the films and she's going about Elmer Bernstein. And then she tells him all the places to shop in Paris and where to get his shoes and where to get her gloves and what the stitching should be like on the gloves and how this perfume by Balmain is $55 an ounce here but it's cheaper in Paris and please get it for me. It's as if they were one individual with two different special areas. And a lot of it was unspoken. Just eye, eye contact, a nodding of something, an idea that they, that they both would agree on. So that's how you begin to separate their artistic personalities and their contributions. But the separating them isn't the important part. It's what they created together. That's why it's so good. Perhaps the greatest Eames design of all was the image of Charles and Ray. Their playful self-portraits, eccentric dress, and quotable quotes all contributed to the endearing picture of a happy, modern couple absorbed in the challenges of their work. Charles and Ray were cultural icons, but their public face masked the deep desire for privacy. After long hours at 901, they would retreat to the home they built in Pacific Palisades, Charles and Ray were their own community, and we were in the satellite group, and so was everybody else. I had no sense that they were trying to keep out the outside world or anything else. They had created a world and a lifestyle that just required them to go in this tunnel from their house to the work you know, back home again. So what you surround yourself with and the choices you make about where you live and how you live and the artifacts you have, they're all based upon trying to create a seamless environment and a seamless life. Originally, the house was designed by Charles with Aero Saarinen as part of the influential case study housing program in 1945. But Charles and Ray were not ones to let a good design rest. Charles Eames and Harold Saarinen designed a house that uh, we now call the Bridge House, and it was for this site, put a cantilever from the hillside out into the middle of the meadow. 
one of the ideas of the house was to use technologies that had come out of the war effort. So all the parts of this house were off the shelf. But the bridge house was never built. After World War II, there were major material shortages. And it took about two or three years to even get the parts that they had ordered. And in that time, Charles and Ray fell in love with this meadow. Spent all, all our, our spare time here. Began to think it would be criminals to put that house in the, in the middle of the field. Charles realized, oh, we're making the classic architect's mistake. You find a beautiful site and you plunk a house in the middle of it. With the meadow in mind, Charles and Ray redesigned the bridge house and began construction. It was relatively quick because they were relying on some form of prefabrication of bringing materials to the site and assembling them. On Christmas Eve, 1949, Charles and Ray moved in. The Eames House in Los Angeles on that bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean is surely one of the great buildings of the 20th century. Known to architectural historians as Case Study House Number 8, it is the archetypal modern house, or at least it started that way. The Eames House, as it was first made, is very different from what it became as they lived in it through the years and as it acquired all their little touches. I think people miss that unless you've really been there and been inside of it. Now, you remember this? You remember this? I do. I do. Uh, I don't remember this one here, but there was at least one at the office. Modern design has this sort of cliche of being the, you know, the homes of supervillains very hard edge things. You can't have, you know, your Pepperidge Farm cookies on the kitchen counter because that's going to ruin, you know, this perfect tableau of this perfect life that you live. But you would never look at the Eames house and think that. The container for your life can be simple, but that doesn't mean your life has to be simple. What was in the house was a combination of things that one hadn't seen before. It was a tumbleweed hanging from the ceiling. Well, now you can see a lot of tumbleweed around in people's houses. But in those days, it was, oh. And near the tumbleweed hanging from the ceiling, there were two Hans Hoffman paintings suspended from the deck of the roof. The floor was just another canvas for Ray. The ceiling was just another canvas. A sofa was a canvas for a collage of objects. She would have entirely all of her famous blue and white dishes stacked up, but she would have little red hearts or little red accents and it was all perfect. I went to uh, dinner at Ray and Charles's house one night and it came to dessert. So what they had arranged for dessert was three bowls of flowers that they put in front of you to admire. So it was a visual dessert. I was really f***ed off with that. <laughs> I can tell you, I, I was really, because I hadn't eaten much, I was saving up for this. So I'm looking at these stupid flowers, you know. I'm saying, what the hell is wrong with these people? You know, I said, I got my car, I drove on to the nearest Dairy Queen. Take your pleasure seriously, Charles said. And that's exactly what they did. <laughs> Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus would come to town. We would all get out our cameras and our ectochrome and we'd go running downtown and we'd photograph the circus. And he said, photograph. What? He said, anything you want, just photograph. And a couple of people in the audience were there to feed you. It was like a machine gun. Somebody was feeding you the cartridges. And I took a lot of pictures. What impressed him was how everybody knew their place. And sometimes they had two or three different tasks that they had to do. The circus looks like a free-for-all and is absolutely a model of constraints. And for Charles, this was one supreme example, the performance. Never let the blood show, he would say. And this went back to his philosophy of no good design, no good performance without restrictions, without restraints, without rules. He goes to the circus and he just is overwhelmed by the richness of everything, you know, the costumes and the wagons and the tent. And he comes back and he's trying to, you can't turn a circus into a piece of furniture, but he's desperately wanting to. 
Charles and Ray did not turn the circus into a chair, but they did turn the Eames office into a circus. He wasn't embarrassed at all about what it is that he was doing. You know, he felt really confident about, yeah, this is a toy shop. This, I'm just having fun here. And you know, somehow or other you guys bring me money and tell me to go ahead and I'm going to. Royalties from Herman Miller gave Charles the freedom to move beyond his reputation as a designer of modern furniture. Herman Miller was always after him to do more chairs and he would do chairs every now and then. But uh, I don't think he liked to think of himself or have others think of him as the chair designer. I was a film critic, and that gave me an excuse to go down to 901. I fell in love with the whole concept of 901, which is a kind of renaissance art workshop where they did everything. At the time, he was considered a kind of cutesy passe little filmmaker, but no one had ever written about the films. films are their own genre. The product not of a film studio concerned with profits, but of a curious mind yearning to communicate the complex beauty of everyday objects. We've never used film as an art form. We just use film as a, a tool. They were at heart a kind of mixture of vanity and self-expression. They only had one obligation and that was to satisfy Charles. Much of our energy is like the guy in vaudeville that has the plates going and he's intent on getting 30 plates spinning at one time. But part of the process is quickly being aware of the ones that are winding down and keeping them spinning. One of the titles that began to circulate with it, you know, all the employees was the Emery because it was like this place where it was, everyone was driven to work all the time. It was 24-7, 365 going to the Eames office and watching people at their desk was like watching people take their brains out and knead them like uh, dough. People that came from the outside couldn't believe that this is the way things were done. But it, it was a, a delicious agony. It was like a temple for me. Many of us understood very well that we were very poorly suited for employment in certain kinds of jobs. We were very well suited to be there. Charles had a terrible time interacting with people. Several times, I hired people, and they would be there like three days, and he'd come to me and say, I just can't stand that guy. Get him out of here. And I never did know what it was that he saw in that person that he just could not work with them. I happened to have a, a sort of an interest in language as a mean of communication, which I like to believe can be simple and direct. Charles, I would say, didn't subscribe to that. Uh, now, we have to, you know, the only thing is, uh, Craig, we have to have some sort of a background before we do this, because one sort of begins to... to... His speech wasn't yada, 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 yada. It was stop and go and stop and go. Mm -hmm. oh, well, you, you, let me cut this. Let me, let me... He had this incredible ability to surround every subject with a little cloud of words. We, we were hoping to, and there are two, there is several things, there was a... You finally got the message at the end of about 15, 20 minutes of wondering what the hell is he talking about? It finally dawned on you that he was telling you you were an absolute clown because there's something wrong. This one is going to have something to do with what I think of as a new covet of ours. He appeared one day at a conference at UCLA and he started to speak. And it just ran right off the track. He looked up and he said, I'm sorry. I just, this isn't going to work today. And somebody said, no, no. So he said, well, give me a minute. So he put his head down. And everybody waited. And it took about two minutes and he raised up. And he just took off. Boom. Reams of paper. 